Last week we did enjoy Ben's great message on community. I know that many of you were blessed as we were looking again at what does God's word say about the design of community. The fact that God has a plan for the church to truly be in fellowship with one another, caring for one another, bearing one another's burdens, making it through a, a fallen world together in faith on our way to heaven. And so that is part of the, the picture that we see throughout the Bible of God's people together in faith. And so uh, we're grateful for that. This morning we come to another one of our key values, one of our core values in the life of the church, and it's mission. Um, the missional aspect of the Christian life. Uh, notice that the, the, the title slide there does not say missions. Um, back up one there, I'm sorry. Uh, I want you to see this. It is mission. The idea is this. It's not just missions as something we do as a church, but the picture is this, that throughout the Bible we see that our God is a God of mission. He has a plan. He has a program. It was before the foundation of the world. And he is moving forward in his plan and in his program. And he, in fact, comes, listen to this, part of the great way that we see his plan is we see Jesus come on a mission. And that's what we're going to see this morning is the mission life of Christ. In fact, we will remember it very vividly. The mission life the mission nature of our God as we come to the Lord's Supper, uh, this table. And so this morning, what we, are, what we are recognizing is a core value of the life of the church is that we would join Jesus, that we would join Jesus in his mission and that we would see the, and say that his mission is our mission. We see that in this passage of Scripture. Now, nowhere is this perhaps more apparent than in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. Do you have your Bible open? I hope you do. Look with me in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, and I want you to notice, and you will need to look at it um, just for a moment. Um, Matthew's first book of the New Testament, um, the Gospel according to Matthew. Notice in um, chapter 1, there's the genealogy of Christ. This is the family lineage of Jesus, recognizing that he is the prophet, priest, and king that was promised um, through his family line. And then we come to chapter 2. If you have an, an ESV, it says the visit of the wise men. So this is coming to the early, uh, just after the birth of Christ in the beginning of that. And we, we see that this attempt is made on Jesus' life very, very early on. I believe Satan seeking to snuff out the Messiah, snuff out the life of the Savior who would redeem all of creation to himself, but he does that with no success. And then we come to chapter 3. We see that there is a forerunner to the preaching of Jesus, and the forerunner of Jesus was a man named John the Baptist. He was a man that was an honorable and faithful man to God. And he was proclaiming the way that, that now has come and the way of Christ is now to be seen, the Messiah. We come to the middle of chapter 3 in Matthew. Um, chapter 3, we see the baptism of Jesus. So the, the thing that we are calling you to do in obedience to the Scripture is something that Jesus has done. Jesus always goes before us. Jesus goes before us in all things. So Jesus is identifying himself with the nature of the church and the nature of God's people. Though God, in the form of man, he is baptized, and he calls us to also be baptized and to follow in him. But then before he begins his public ministry, chapter 4 shows us what? Are you looking at chapter 4? What does it say at the top of chapter 4? Okay, many of you says the temptation of Jesus or the wilderness um, encounter with Satan. And so Satan once again is seeking to distract, seeking to pull the Messiah away from going and doing what his mission has been given to do. And so Satan takes him to, to show him the kingdoms of the world and say, these can be yours. Well, they were already his. And yet we see over and over again Jesus is responding with, no, God has a plan. 
and it's not your plan. And then in chapter 4, verse 12, we see that Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee, and I want you to go to verse 17, and um, it's, a, it's a tag on at the end of a thought, but it's very important as we introduce this passage. Look at chapter 4 in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to what? Jesus began to preach. He hadn't been preaching before now. This is the beginning of his ministry. And I want you to see what he says. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the very first words of the Messiah when he shows up on the earth to begin telling us what we need to hear, he's saying to a lost and fallen world, turn back to God. Turn to God. Repent. Repent means you're going one way and you turn around and you go the other way. That's what it means. It means to do a U-turn. It means to forsake the direction that you're going and turn back into another direction. And here we see that the beginning words of the Messiah, of the one who would come and say, I love you, let me show you that I love you, and he lays down his life for us. This means the Messiah. He's going to pay for our sins. He begins by saying, turn back to God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look at verse 18 with me. And this is in the box on your page that is there. Um, but there's a, a beautiful part here for us to see about Jesus' mission and his call for us to join his mission. Look at verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called who? Peter, Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Look at verse 19. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Verse 22, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, unfortunately, many of us have heard these passages if you grew up coming to church and if you grew up in Sunday school as a child. I'm interested to know, and this is no holiness contest, I'm just curious. How many of you grew up regularly, you could almost say Sunday after Sunday, and if you didn't, that's okay. But if you, if you did, if you grew up regularly going to Sunday school, would you please just lift your hand? Okay, so how many of you did not regularly go, grow up going to Sunday school? So many of you, maybe even a quarter to a third of the crowd did not go to church. And here you are. Praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. However you got here, we're, we're, praise the Lord. That's great. But for those of us who did grow up going to church, very often when we see these verses, we kind of remember these verses from Sunday school days. And if we're not careful, we, we will kind of put these into a child's Sunday school mode than when we, we first heard them. At Sheridan Hills, we have a conviction that we do not want to give our children in Sunday school a faith that they will grow out of. We want to give them a faith that they will what? Grow into. You see, many churches have passed out a faith that when they become an adult, they grow out of it. Oh, yeah, I used to believe those stories, the Bible, stories of the Bible. They're sweet and everything. And, and you know, I kind of know a few of them or I know a lot of them. But, but, you know, I don't really know how they relate to me. Not really quite sure. Well, this morning, I want us to break that barrier a little bit. I want us to see that this is incredibly important to us as adults, as, as young people growing up perhaps, or even as people in the seasons of life toward our later part of life, that this is incredibly instructive to the values that Jesus has for our life while we're here on this earth and joining him in this mission. I want us to notice seven things from this text very quickly. We're going to write fast. Number one, notice that this is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
And when we look um, through chapter 3 and chapter 4, we see several important things setting up the ministry. But the reason I want you to notice that is because of chapter 4, verse 17. And chapter 4, verse 17 begins with, turn to God. Repent, for now the kingdom of God is coming into fruition. It's coming in near to you, and it is calling you. Some of you this morning, you simply need to repent of your sin and come to God. Somehow, some way, he has called you into this service, and maybe you've been here many times before, or maybe this is your first time, or your tenth time, whatever it may be, but God is calling you to turn away from, and let some things go and run to him in faith. Here we see this is the message that Jesus begins with. It is the message that humans need to hear. Notice the second thing that is here. Notice, notice Jesus' first words of preaching, and we've just said it, is repent. That's important for us to see, that people need to turn to God. God is not an add-on for our life. There's many people out of cultural Christianity that, you know, they kind of, they've added it because, you know, I go to church and it makes me feel better, or I go to church and it gives me peace, or I go to church and it, you know, it just, you know, you live a little bit better life. That is not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is, is that we must turn to God away from sin and self that we turn away from all those things and all of the world that has rebelled against God. We turn to God. Notice the number three that is here. Jesus' selection of ordinary people. The Messiah didn't come calling the intelligentsia of society in his day. He didn't come calling together the powerful. He didn't come calling together the beautiful. He didn't come calling together, what's the name of the show that's on television? The Bold and the Beautiful or something like it? Is that gone now, I hope? <laughs> Praise the Lord, that's gone. Um, shouldn't watch that stuff, it'll rot your brain, really. Um, it'll eat out your heart. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll ruin you. But the, the picture is this that the world looks at the bold and the beautiful, the world looks at the powerful, the world looks at all these things, and God knows what he is about, and his goal is to show his power through his people. And so sometimes he comes to those who are, to some degree, the outcasts um, of society, and he uses them in ways that all would say, these are not learned men, these are not powerful men, but they have a powerful message, and we see that happening many years later in Peter's life. Notice the next part, number four. Jesus, notice Jesus' simple command to follow. Jesus' simple command to follow. He simply says, follow me. But don't just notice the simple follow me. Notice that it comes with a strange promise. Number five is Jesus' strange promise I will make you fishers of men. Now, go back to Sunday school mode. You and I, for those of you who grew up here in this church or some other church, you grew up hearing this idea of being a fisher of men. So that, that's not a new concept. Some of you that are new to the, studying the Bible, you go, what in the world is a fisher of men? I mean, that's, that's strange. Why, why would you? Let me tell you that I believe that that was very strange to these four the fishermen that were there. That Jesus is saying, come and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of what? What is that? But here we begin to see, even at the beginning, not only the need for man to repent, but we begin to see the invitation of God to join him in his mission. Mission. You see, from the very beginning of God calling out his disciples, from the very beginning, Jesus is saying, come with me, I have a job for you to do. You see, it's not just to come to me, I will save you. It's that, that in itself is part of the beauty of this call. But it's come because we're going to work together. Come because I have a mission for you. Now, there's many, many Christians who I believe have not seen that his mission is our mission, that the mission that 
is put before us seems to be optional. But here we see it's not optional at all. It's in the same breath. Follow me, for I will make you fishers of men. Are, are you getting it? I hope you to see this. I want you to see this. We need to see that this is a, a foundational truth, a foundational value that goes straight down into the core of God's plan and God's call. Notice this, not only this strange promise, but number six. This is so interesting in verse 20 and verse 22. Look at verse 20. It says, immediately they left their nets. Will you circle the word immediately? And look at verse 22. Immediately, this is John and James, they left their boat. So both of these two teams leave, I mean, this is immediate obedience to Christ's command. This is part of the characterization of God's people. When they hear his voice, they respond and they obey. This is part of what we see through the scripture, as we'll see in a few moments, um, prevalent throughout the teachings of Jesus. But also notice, don't miss this, notice the enormous cost Notice the enormous cost of this calling and of this mission. You see, these guys are called to leave their career, and notice this, to even leave their family. So here we see the creator of the universe come up and begin calling names. He begins calling people to himself, and as he begins to call them to himself in a, in a very, very literal way, calls them to himself, we see that, there, that there's a priority of his voice over the voices of the world. We begin to see that this is the sovereign God of the universe calling out those whom he's created, calling out those whom he has a plan for. And what he's saying is, my voice trumps all other voices. My voice comes above all others. And my calling goes above your job. It goes above even your own family because I, have the, I am the one who created you. We could, we could begin to fill in those gaps as we seek to understand this priority of God upon our lives. So we notice the enormous cost. In fact, Jesus said that if anyone does not count the cost and follow understanding the cost, we, we cannot really follow him at all. So Notice number, number one, I want us to see in this, that Jesus comes to fulfill the ultimate mission. Jesus has embarked upon this ultimate mission, and it's the ultimate mission in all of the universe. There is no greater mission than the one that Jesus, the Savior of the world, would come to perform. Um, many times we have Hollywood over on the other side of the United States, Hollywood, California, and they or some other, some other places turn out stories. Um, and many times the stories uh, that they turn out through, through movies, uh, any, any of the uh, big thriller, I don't know if thriller is the right word, but the action films, it usually has to do with the storyline that has to do with saving what? The world, right? Saving the world. That there is some diabolical person that has some diabolical weapon and some diabolical plan, diabolical means devilish, some demonic thing that is going to destroy and for his own power, for his own gain, he's seeking to put that into play and there is one who is coming to head off certain cataclysmic disaster, if not for all, for many. We'll multiply that times 10 billion and you still won't be to the mission of Jesus. Because here, the mission of Jesus is to say all that we see of God's people throughout the ages, and not only God's people, but God's creation. And so God is going to come and give his life in this grand mission to redeem the world to himself. He doesn't have to do that. He could snap his fingers, be done with it, everything would be over. The last time I did that, I clapped and the lights went out. Um, but, you know, the point is this, he doesn't have to save anybody. He would be completely justified by walking away with a puff of smoke where the universe used to be, but that's not the God that he is. He would be justified to leave us in our sin. He would be justified to condemn us 
in our transgression, but that's not what he does. In his grace and in his mercy, he does the most extraordinary thing is that he comes and he lays down his own life for those who reject him. So notice here with me the ultimate mission in all of the universe. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is at the end of the story of Zacchaeus. He says to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. I'm taking you to, we're going to your house today. And, and there's this very curious phrase there. Jesus declares to those who are listening, for this is a son of Abraham. Now, son of Abraham doesn't simply mean that he's Jewish. Everybody around them was Jewish that day. But the picture here is that when Jesus says, Zacchaeus, you, a chief tax collector, one who has ripped off many, is a prime example for me to show that I, as God, think differently than the people that are looking at you right now. They all know that you're a cheat, but I'm going to call you mine. I'm calling you out of all of your rejection and out of all of your selfishness and out of all of your sin. I'm calling you to me because you're one of mine. Now that goes back to, write it down, Genesis chapter 12 off to the side. It's the promise of the covenant to Abraham that through Abraham and his seed and his people there will be one who comes and, and he will be a blessing to the whole world. That Abraham and his family is going to bless the whole world. And it's through Abraham's family that Jesus the Messiah would come. That is um, changed over to the Davidic covenant a thousand years later when David would come and he would raise up the priestly line, the kingly line, the royal line through which Jesus would come. So these covenants that God is bringing people, he's bringing salvation to himself. That's what we see, the march through the Old Testament to the cross of Christ. And here we see that the whole reason of this was to seek and to save that which was lost. And it's a, it's a beautiful picture of how he calls Zacchaeus to himself and says, this isn't just a Jewish man, this is one for whom I will die. This is the picture of God's salvation, calling us to himself. Look at John chapter 3 in verse 16. Here we see the ultimate mission in the universe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is the good news. This is the good news of a God who comes and gives his life for his people, calling them to himself. Now you have in bold letters at the bottom of this page something that we need to do every now and then. We need to very explicitly say the gospel in perhaps a different way than we've said it recently. And we do this with the hope of clarifying something in our minds and in our hearts, stating it anew and afresh. Some of you, maybe, maybe there's a phrase here that's going to, I have prayed, would get your heart. It would grip your heart. It would touch you and help you see the gospel that much clearer the depth of what God has done. So I want you to notice this and fill this in. This is all one sentence. And I want you to see this, and you, you see that there's just a few passages listed below, but there's, there's hundreds of passages that we could refer to in the New Testament because the New Testament is all about what this statement says. Notice this. True Christians know and believe that Jesus was sent from God as God. Jesus was sent from God as God to be the only acceptable sacrifice for their sin. As he died in their place, taking the wrath of God upon himself so that all who repent and believe in his sacrifice and not themselves will be completely what? Forgiven and made a totally new creation in the eyes of God. Now you say, shouldn't you just say a new creation, period, and let that be it? And I mean, you're just a new creation when you're in Christ. Doesn't matter 
whether it's in the eyes of God or not. No, listen, I, I, I add this to this statement because of this. Don't flip your sheet over yet. Don't you dare do that. This is too important. I want you to see this. We need to see that it is God coming as God to lay down his life, taking our sin upon himself, taking our payment upon himself. We call this the vicarious death of Christ in our place. He is the substitute for us. And here, the the life that we deserve to die, he dies as the only acceptable sacrifice because he is the only sinless one. And he comes and he forgives us and he makes us a new creation. Now the world doesn't see that he has done that in this life. Always. They may see it a little bit. In fact, God often does call people through the change in our life that they notice and they, they come to see that to some degree. But it's very often, it won't be truly known and understand until we get to heaven and we see the total new heaven and the new earth that God has made for us to be in and that he has remade us in vivid color. But we do get Hence, the Apostle Paul says, for now we see through a glass darkly. That means we see through a, like a faded mirror what is to come, or we see through a, a glass that is a smoked glass. It's not real clear. We can't fully see all that God has in store, but we know what he has said. But one day we will see the new creation that he has designed. And so, number one is this picture that Jesus comes to fulfill the ultimate mission in all the universe, and that is to redeem people for God's glory. Now you can safely change the page. We as a church need to recognize that this grand mission, the grandest mission of all the universe, is also our mission as a church and as individuals. So this strange promise comes into play. And notice with me the strange promise. You see it up there at the top of the page. It says, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, again, that would be a curious statement to them, but let's look and see. Number two is this. Jesus commands us to join him in finishing his mission. This is what he's doing. He saves us to join him in the process of finishing his mission of saving his people who are in the world. In John chapter 17 and verse 18, Jesus is praying to the Father. This is called the high priestly prayer of John 17. He says this in his prayer. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent what? Them into the world. You see, Jesus has, has, by the time John 17 comes, this is at the end of his life, this is when he's about to go to the cross, and as he's about to go to the cross, he is saying, Lord, I, Father, I have taught them all that they are to be taught, and now is the time, as I lay down my life for them, as I go to the cross for them, I am sending them into the world to tell the world of our love. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 21. Jesus says to them, he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. This is after the resurrection. He comes into the room through a wall. They are terrified. They look and they see. And he tells them right away, he's letting them know, be at peace. Everything that I said to you is true. I have come again. And here I am sending you out to the world that the world may know what I have done. Even as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So we join Jesus in his mission. In Matthew chapter 28, a few days later, as he's ascending to the Father, just as he's there ascending to the Father, we read these words. He says, go therefore and make disciples. That is the only imperative verb in this sentence. So the whole point of these two verses is make disciples. It says how you're going to make disciples. As you're going, I want you to go make disciples, and you're going to baptize them, and you're going to teach them. But the whole point is make disciples. So notice this. Go, therefore, and make disciples. How are you going to do that of all nations? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We just observe that. 
You see, this is the Lord's command, to baptize, to be baptized. Look at verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here is what we call the great commission, or the great instruction that he gives. We are called to finish the mission. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see it again. Look what it says. Let's read Acts chapter 1, verse 8 out loud together. Are you ready? Everybody clear your throat. <clears throat> Here we go. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So here is the picture again. We see that this is God's plan, that his people join him on his mission. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 3, and it's reflected throughout the scriptures, that's why I put several other references there next to this in parentheses, but look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. So do you want to know if you know God? The question is, do you keep his commandments? You mean the Big Ten? Oh, no. Much more than the Big Ten. The picture is this, that, that we come to the call of Christ, that we come to the instructions of Christ, that we come to the life that is so far beyond just ten commandments, as, as glorious as that is, we see that those could never be kept in our own strength. That's part of the reason that they were given, to show us our need for God. And so now we come to the call of Christ, the call to repentance, the call to identify ourselves with Christ, and then as at his bidding to do whatever he calls us to do. You see, it's, it's much more than the Big Ten. It's your whole life and all that you are. And Jesus says, these are the people who know me. These are the people who I am Lord and Savior of their life, and they hear my voice and they obey. Now, part of the reason that I've wanted to preach this message and I've wanted to make this statement is because of this. And Marcy, has, we, Marcy and I just went to two different missions conferences, so you're getting it back to back a little bit um, from a week of really studying missions and being a part of this. But Marcy said, you know, I think that many churches have been ripped off because in their minds, in much of Christians, Christian discipleship, missions and evangelism and discipleship, all of this thing of making disciples, has been optional. That, you know, that's for the super spiritual, or, you know, it, was, it wasn't stated and it wasn't said that, no, 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 no. This is clearly God's plan. This is clearly his design. That you have been called to come and to join God on the earth. You have been called to come and be a son, be a daughter of God on the earth, joining the Father in his work. It's not optional. It's not that you just kind of come to church, you filled out a card, you said a prayer, you were baptized, and then you kind of just kind of coast along in your Christian life. Oh, no, we're called to come and join the army. We're called to come and join the team. We're called out of the stands onto the field. We're called with our life to honor and to obey and to reflect the one who, come, who came and said, I'm on a mission come join me. And so this is the picture that we have. You see, the, the scriptures make clear, that, and, and, and Jesus couldn't be clearer in these passages that we've just looked at, that true Christians, fill this in, true Christians make disciples. True Christians make disciples. That's what Matthew 28 says in the picture that we are called in our identity, both locally and globally, to make disciples. This is a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus says that if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. If you love me, you're going to do what I've told you to do. If you don't do what I've told you to do, you don't love me. And if you don't love me, you're not mine. Wow. And so God has called us to see the joy of this. And, and part of what Marcy's expression was was this. 
missions and being on mission with God is so great. It's not a burden. It's a joy. Listen to this. It's a privilege when you begin to see God working through you and using you and answering your prayers and coming and giving you words and giving you abilities and giving you things that you never saw within yourself because you are being obedient to him and he is beginning to use you. You see, it's not about obligation. It's about privilege. And so hear my voice today, Sheridan Hills, that God, if you are his child, he has saved you for his purpose, for a purpose. He saved you to use you. And that missions is not an obligation, even though it is a command. And I want you to see these very clearly. You see, this command to come and to join God in what he's doing, it isn't a request. It's a command. It, fill it in. It isn't a request. It isn't a suggestion. It's an imperative. It isn't optional. It is mandatory. Some of you are saying, wow, I got saved a few weeks ago or three months ago. Y'all didn't tell me this. <laughs> well, we're telling you now. That's all right. Just embrace what God, has, what God has shown us and called us to. Look at this. This isn't for the professional. You know, there's a lot of people that say, well, this is, you know, the, the missions is for the, you know, the really professional Christian. Well, let me just tell you, there are no professional Christians. There's only one professional Christian. His name is Jesus. He's, he's the one. And, and what we see is that Jesus is going after fishermen, okay? He's, he's going after, you know, sometimes you look at them and you listen to them and you hear their questions and they're about as sharp as a bowling ball. I mean, you, you just go, wow, they were learning like I have to learn. And we need to see that through all history, that's what God does. You see, they're not the super spiritual. Um, there's times at which we see they're very unspiritual. They're very fleshly and they've made big mistakes, just like me and just like you. But you, what we do see is that this is the call for the ordinary Christian. This is the call that God gives us in who he is for those who are the ordinary person. You see, every Christian is called to be, connect, be concerned about every family, friend, and nation. You see, missions is to be on the mind of the Christian. The mission of God is what God has called us to. Now, some of you um, were in high school in the 1980s. Anybody want to admit to being in high school in the 1980s? Some of you, those of you that were my, my, my present, you remember somewhere along the way that you started, this, this, this phrase was made, this slogan or this phrase was made popular in the 1980s. It probably said before that, but 1980s it became very popular. Anybody want to help me out here? Friends don't let friends what? Drive drunk. Exactly right. That, that, was, that was a really popular, it was on t-shirts, it was on the posters on the wall, South Broward, Hollywood Hills, Chaminade, everywhere. You know, that's, that's what was there. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, in a, in a similar idea here, look at the last point that is here. True friends share the gospel with friends. You see, true friends share the gospel with friends. God has called us to be a people who are engaging the people that are around us with the glorious news that they can be forgiven, that they can be truly God's people. In fact, notice the screen in front of you. Here's, this begs another question. How much do you have to hate someone not to tell them that they can be saved through Christ? Why don't you just stare at that question and look what it says. How much do you have to hate someone not to tell them that they can be saved through Christ? So I've never looked at it that way. Friends, listen. If we believe the gospel, if we believe that this is the truth of God, God has given us the privilege of sharing that news with others. And there are some who are going to receive that. And there are some who are going to reject that. There's some who are going to push back against that. But we, we see that throughout history, God's people in obedience joining him. Listen, 
They rejected Jesus and they crucified him to a cross. You say, well, I don't want them to do that to me. Oh, but listen, I would much rather fear the one who after he's killed me can cast me into hell than he who after he's killed me, he's done all that he can do. Jesus said that himself. And so we come to see that true friends share the gospel with friends. This is part of being on mission with Christ. What is the proper motivation of our mission work? Here it is, of our mission life. It is Christ's love for us and in us. This is the motivation, that Christ loved us and he moves in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says, and underline this first part, it says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. You see, this is on mission with him. But for him who died for them and was raised again. Here's the picture that Jesus' love and his work in us compels us to live for him and not merely for ourselves. Application. How do we join his mission? Number one, the glorious gospel of Christ should be, and here, here's, here's really an outflow of what we just read, should be so full in you that it flows from you. Here's the picture. God's truth, God's goodness, the reality of this table in front of us should be have our hearts so filled with gratitude and so filled with awe and so filled with love that when we get around others, the picture is, is that our mission to them and serving them or loving them or telling them the gospel is not out of obligation but out of privilege and joy. You see, so often we have made the gospel merely an obligation that we have removed its joy and the privilege of it. So the glorious gospel of Christ should be full in us. So it flows from us. It's not forced from us. Number two, how do we fulfill this mission? You profess him, and you can begin professing him through baptism. That's, that's a very, very hands-on approach, very, very direct way you profess him through baptism. You see, you identify with Christ and his people. This is the confession of baptism, that I am with Christ, Christ is with me. And it's not only I am with Christ, but I am with his people. I am one of the baptized ones. I'm one of the ones that have said publicly, I am with Christ. That's why in our church, we, we recognize that the Bible calls all Christians to be baptized as a symbol, an outward confession of an inward experience in an inward faith. And so this is joining into church membership. This is joining into the body of Christ, saying, I am one of them. Look at number three. How can you join the mission? Number three, ask yourself these questions. Have I truly turned to follow Jesus with my whole life? Does he really have control of me? Think of Peter and Andrew, James and John. What did they leave? They left everything. They left their careers. They left their family. They left their reputations. They, they left it all to, the, to follow the one who would say, come and follow me. Now, he calls us to turn to him completely with our whole life. Now, as we do that, I just want to say that he sometimes lets us stay right where we are and we keep doing what we're doing, but in what his call has been to, to live Christ before the people, but sometimes he calls us to radically change what we're doing. Sometimes he calls us to, to leave where we are. How about this? Have I resisted, for whatever reason, joining his mission? Have I resisted, for whatever reason, joining his mission? Put out there to the side, maybe fear, or worse, apathy. Or maybe I just haven't known. Maybe it's been ignorance. Um, I want to say to you that God calls us to join him in, the, in our mission, in his mission. And as we do that, he gives us the strength and the power to obey. Finally, here's the question. Will I embrace his command 
to proclaim his death in life to the lost. You see, Sheridan Hills, the question is, will we obey? The question for you is, will you obey? Being the light that he has called us to be, to not hide the light of Christ, not hide the message of the gospel in our hearts. This is about me inviting my friends to Christ. This is about me inviting my neighbors to Christ. I think of Mr. and Mrs. Salinas across the street from me as I've gotten to know them, as we've killed iguanas together, as we've planted plants together and trees together. You say, what in the world did he just say? Yeah, me and I have this older man that's across the street and he has, grows all kinds of things and he hates the iguanas. They eat all the vegetables and all the stuff that he grows. And so we shoot iguanas together. It's kind of fun. And, and the, I know some of you are freaking out right now now Marcy's staring at me but but I mean so I'm using whatever means it takes you know to get to know and and I'm building a relationship with them because I I so desire for for God to do a work that he would see that there's a savior who died what are we doing how are we using what God has given us to build relationships to embrace the command to proclaim his death in his life to the lost. Number four, one of the ways that we can join God in his mission is what we're about to do right now. Number four, profess him together through remembering his sacrifice at his table. That we remember his sacrifice at his table. Now, don't, 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 don't. Look carefully at the bottom of the sheet. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is the passage that we typically read in, this pa- in, in, in 1 Corinthians that talks about the Lord's Supper. And I want you to notice this verse, this simple verse, right in the middle of this common passage referring to the Lord's Supper. Look what is stated. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you do what? You proclaim the Lord's death. You see, this is the mission of Christ, that a Savior has died, that people can be forgiven and know God. This morning, we come to join God in his mission. We come to remember what has the price that has been paid for our sins. And in doing so, we are proclaiming Christ to a world that so desperately needs him. Would you stand with me for prayer?